The Dauntless Pardon me, madam, however you seem to be wandering a little too close to an area guests aren't allowed in. Sir Philip notes calmly as Melan notices him for the first time. She freezes and examines him closely. Her eyes pay attention to the wrinkles on his face and the fact that his nose seems well and truly oversized on him at this stage in his life. My apologies, um, you're Sir Masterson? Sir Philip will do, miss? All right, I'm just getting more confused. I saw the films and read a bit of the books. They were clearly labeled fiction. You're not supposed to be real. Malon states, and he chuckles. The truth can often be far stranger than fiction, madam. Still, I know that look on your face. You're in need of answers. How may I help? Sir Philip offers her and she blinks for a moment before sighing. Ah, the lovelorn sigh. I've seen that enough to recognize it on sight, madam. Have you? Oh my yes, in the mirror and in the faces of another. Care to talk, madam? He asks her and she sighs after a minute. I want, I want a human, but your species is very different. Very, very different. Basic reason states that using the same techniques in a new circumstance is nothing short of foolish and a good way to get yourself hurt. Melan remarks and Sir Philip nods. There is wisdom there of a sort. Have you even tried? I would prefer to fully evaluate the situation first, get some information and she heaves off a sigh. He also doesn't know me that well. I become a different person when I'm excited. When things are calm, I think and plan, but when there's things to be done, you move first and think second. An easy habit to get into, and there are far worse traits to have. Sir Philip consoles her even as he suppresses the smirk. This is going to be amusing, although Sometimes the greatest amusement can be done in a very different way. He inputs a slight code and adjusts himself for comfort, whispering a name beneath a cough into a small microphone hidden in his glove. He feels a slight vibration from his communicator followed by two more. Message received. Are you all right, sir? She asks him, and he waves it off. I'm old. You don't have to be. My granddaughters and grandsons won't be able to recognize me if I'm not. Bless their hearts, their innocent souls, and I'd rather not cause them any confusion. Sir Philip lies smoothly. The truth of the matter is that he's nearly fully restored and simply kept the outer appearance of age. It will fade in time, but he's slowing it. He's back in his prime, but it won't show outwardly for at least a decade plenty of time to get things done. So you do know how human courtship works? How do I get a specific human to notice me? She asks, and thank God in heaven, the timing is perfect. Oh, what's this? Some young lady needs some help from the date doctor? A very amused and very boisterous voice states with the strum of guitar strings as a young, dark-skinned soldier slips around the corner with a guitar in his hands. Amadi Nenge Adegoke, master of illusions, complete cretin and masterful icebreaker. Not all interactions need to be pushing towards a singular goal. Sometimes a man just needs his entertainment. The date doctor? Wait, why do you have an illusionary instrument? Melan asks incredulously. He strums the guitar a few times. He can make it sound good, but he can't actually play that instrument properly even if a gun was held to his head. He then tosses it to the side and it dissolves as he's no longer feeding Axiom into the construct to keep it intact. Never mind the guitar. What is it that you need? I can't simply stand aside and let a potential romance go unaided, Amadi says with a genuine looking, but in truth a mocking smile. Really? And what do you suggest exactly? Melan asks and Amadi puts an arm around her shoulders. My dear girl, if you follow my advice, you'll have him in the palm of your hand figuratively or literally if you're the type for that kind of fun, Amadi says in a friendly tone. 
Sir Philip cannot help but mentally compare this to the equivalent of tossing a puppy into a pool full of ravenous piranha, especially when he starts to hear Amadi's many suggestions that are taken at face value by the woman. He makes a note to extend another invitation for the man to join the intelligence division. He has a talent, if only he can keep his chaotic tendencies under wraps. As he offers Melon more and more suggestions, Sir Philip changes his mind somewhat. No, this amount of chaos would not be a good thing in intelligence. Directed at an opponent, Amadi can no doubt make people question which way is up and what color the sky is. And within three minutes, Amadi has Melon believing some very bad ideas and off to go get the supplies after Amadi helpfully offers her some actually factual information. After Meilan departs, there is an illusion in place blocking the sound from Amadi as he lets out gales of laughter and he gives himself time to get it all out of his system and wipe his eyes. That was utterly despicable of you, young man, Sir Philip chides him with only a hint of his amusement in his voice. If you didn't want a web of lies, then why did you call a spider? Amadi asks with laughter in his voice. I was expected a more structured web. He lies. He knew this is exactly what would happen. Amadi's general policy is that if you get caught, increase the chaos until no one can even remember you were involved. The man is a living distraction. Funnel web all the way, my friend. Just because you can see my madness doesn't mean you can do much of anything about it without being caught within, Amadi replies. Thank you for this opportunity for some fun, sir. You save the day I'm going to be laughing through my entire guard shift. Not too loudly, though. You don't want to spoil things after all. Not my first hunt, sir. Don't worry, Amadi says. Incidentally, my patrols will bring me rather close to where Maji's bunk room is. Try not to be too obvious, Sir Philip says to the man who just cloaked himself in an illusion. What's that? Is the old man talking to himself? How weird, maybe he's senile. Whispers around Sir Philip who just shakes his head in amusement and pats the invisible and intangible man on the shoulder without any issue. At the end of his break, Modan sighs to himself after returning to the Dauntless. He and Jadza had agreed that two nights in a row together would be a bit much, especially as she needed to be debriefed by her government or they'd start to get paranoid. So time apart was needed. Then he pauses just outside his small bunk room and glares at the opaque door. He can sense someone's axiom inside, someone nervous, eager, and proud. Is that? Is Meilan in his room? She's moving quickly. He mentally braces himself and opens the door. Then he immediately closes it so he can take a moment to process exactly what he just saw. He then glares down the hallway to see the hint of someone ducking back around a corner. He wants to confront the bastard, but first he needs to deal with what's in his room. Yeehaw, beer, bread, or bitches, Melan asks in broken English. Modan just stares as she has a tiny American flag bikini on with cowboy boots, a 10-gallon hat, and has a platter with beer and sandwiches on it. Who put you up to this? Y'all want to ride this pony girl? Melan asks, sounding increasingly unsure with the heavily accent language she's clearly not able to understand or properly speak. Okay, stop. He says, stepping fully into the room and taking the platter from her to put on his tiny side table dresser. Who put you up to this? Um, she says as the final bits of uncertainty are washed away and now she knows she's been taken for a ride. The embarrassment is written clearly across her face. Uh, he said his name was the date doctor? There are about 40 different clowns who can and will call themselves that at random throughout this ship. None of them are to be taken seriously, and if they start to give advice, the appropriate course of action is to draw a weapon and give them a 10-second countdown until you use it. Modan states as she shifts the giant hat to hide her face in shame. Right well, enough with the stupid hat. 
he says, pulling it off her head, and she can see that he's shucked off his jacket and has held it out to her. She slips it on. So, this was just a terrible joke on his part. He showed me some words for what kind of fetish this is. All-American babe and things like that, Melan notes. I'm from Bangladesh. I'm not American, he replies before sighing. Still, I'm not sure of the culture or appropriateness of, well, so you are attracted to me, she asks. I'd have to be insane not to be. You're in amazing shape, are extremely skilled and immensely beautiful, but I've just begun with Jadza and I don't want to ruin things. Why would it do that? I don't know. I don't know much of anything about your culture. I know little about Jadza's and to be frank, I don't want to possibly ruin what... Hello, Jadza, Melan asks on the communicator she had in an expanded space tattoo on her scalp. Her hair occasionally got caught in it, but it was so useful to have that it was worth the annoyances. Melan, how and when did you get my personal number? Jadza demands immediately. I have a scanner program on my communicator. I'm trying to seduce Modan and I've run up against the brick wall of his morals and his desire to make it work with you. You're on speaker. Do you have the time and expertise to be first wife or shall I have that responsibility? Melon asks. We'll have that talk later. Where are you? Staring him down as he's contemplating running away from his own bunk room on the ship. Melon states, and there's some laughter from Jadza. Jump on him quick then, with my blessing, Jadza says. What? Modan asks, right as he's tackled by an almost entirely naked woman, and she instantly has his lips and she moans as the pheromones hit her like a hammer. Modan wakes up the next morning to his communicator going off and he grabs it off the side table, his reaching hand knocking over an emptied can of beer that falls to the floor with a clatter. Yes? He asks into the device without opening his eyes. Have fun? Jadza asks. She hasn't let me go yet. Modan states even as Maylene shuffles a bit under the blankets and he tries not to vocalize that he and her are still connected. You know, I wasn't expecting her to play the long game. I met her the day before yesterday, and she was already interested then. It took over 24 hours for her to actually make her first request to jump in. That's a long game. It is on Centris. Of course, and in the Therocyte Republic? Fairly quick. We're a prosperous people, so men get snatched up fast. What? The less wealth there is in any one area, the longer a courtship takes to make sure that there's enough the woman can contribute to the family. Oh, oh, that makes sense. So, is my new sister wife a screamer? Jadza asks in a teasing tone. No, but she instinctively uses axiom when she clenches. He states, and there's a snort of amusement from Jadza. This is going to keep growing, isn't it? Modan asks. Yes, in fact. I have another three here that are asking me to meet you. Of course, since the first wife bit hasn't been determined, I can't give approval yet. We have a lot to talk about later, Jadza says in a very amused tone. All right, what's so funny? If this is normal, then what's so funny? Just imagining how this feels for you. Mr. Awkward and Adorable going from single to on his way to properly married. Before the end of the month, you'll be able to walk through arrangement systems without issue. Dear God, I'm sure your Kaylee will have mercy on your soul. So who's trying to get in on this growing family? A trinity of Gravia siblings, the 420 siblings, 